He, the son, is a sailor, and she, the mother, a soldier. Why? Because like a soldier, she would die for him. Like a soldier, she spends the entire day wading through trenches, doing mundane tasks, fighting to survive, really, in the heavy demands of the army, if you will. And moreover, when she's the last woman standing, she will fight for her sailor. Day and night, she carries this heavy weight around her, like a ticking bomb, because that's what a child essentially is. Anything can set it off, anything can make the child cry, make the child upset. So she carries on day and night, and while soldiers may have their rest, there is no rest for a mother. Except when she temporarily meets a friend in the park, when she has the opportunity to socialize with her old friend who knows her as when she was a woman and not a mother, and when she gets the chance to socialize her kid with other kids and experience the huge joy of childhood. Unless, does she actually meet that friend from work? Does she actually meet another human being? We don't know, because she's so tired and exhausted from motherhood, from constantly being up on her feet, from never sleeping, from trying to take care of an infant for whom the whole world is a danger, that it gets incredibly difficult to follow her narrative, to follow her train of thought, and to really be sure of reality. It's difficult to stay present, to stay aware of your surroundings. Every day she drops to bed for a temporary respite exhausted. Every day she spends waiting for bedtime, uh, for just surviving and counting down hours until she can bathe the baby and get it to sleep and for the first time touch the bed herself. And throughout all this she has to deal with her general's orders, just like in the army. All her husband does when he comes back is gives her orders like, oh have you tried this, have you tried this, except it's not really phrased as have you tried this, it's phrased as why can you not stop the child from screaming. I have to wake up early for work the next day. Or he asks questions like, what's for dinner? When the entire day she has spent chasing around a child that has learned to run, rather than chopping and peeling carrots. Throughout this startling and difficult affair, she's also haunted by flashbacks. By PTSD, if you will. But the opposite? So if soldiers tend to be haunted after the affair, for a mother, there is no stop to this affair, and there is only a former comparison. She dreams of her former life, when she would go to work, when she would step outside the house, what luxury to step outside the house, in clothes that are not stained, but in office clothes, and when she would be treated as a normal person, and talked to not as not and not addressed as mother but addressed by her name throughout this book there is not a single use of her name because she loses it she becomes simply a mother as she loses her identity and she's haunted by those past glimpses of it by clinging on to something that seems so far away that it's almost like a dream she finds herself asking was that really me and that is the book summarized summarized without any spoilers in fact because it's all in the blurb and the problem for me is that it doesn't go much beyond that. But let's start with the good first. In fact, let's start with the great, because there is a lot of greatness in Soldier Sailor. Soldier Sailor is harrowing. Soldier Sailor is emotional, heartbreaking, gut-wrenching, poignant. The extended metaphor of the soldier and the sailor is developed brilliantly. But what else is there? This is a work that is fantastic in showing us the truth of mother's everyday life. In fact, I would argue that this is a must-read for anyone who has ever thought that motherhood is easy, or for anyone who has ever devalued a mother's work, or even as is normal and usual, I suppose, when you're standing in the supermarket queue and you see a mother with a screaming toddler, your first thought is not empathy, oh, this poor woman who can't control her child, it's, oh my god, can she get the child to be silent? Uh, so I would say that this is a must read for anyone who has ever thought those thoughts. The topic is an emotional one for many, and indeed we live through the entire spectra of emotions, from the panic of losing an infant even for a second, to the joy of having the child smile back at you and light you up with the innocence and happiness that only a baby can convey, to the guilt of not being the perfect caretaker. Kilroy paints the mundane brilliantly, aptly. She makes us wonder and say, of course, why didn't we think of that before? That's the right way to put it. That's exactly what it is. The commentary on gender reads, at times bitter but always pertinent. It's a peak example, a prime example of female rage and fury at its finest, and moments that are maybe not so talked about in pop culture. Moments when a mother is so tired that she's willing to let her child play with dangerous toys just because she's willing to have a second of rest. These are moments that are not usually explored, so it's great to break the topic of taboo and 
as a conversation starter, this is wonderful. It's intimate, it's personal, it's there to spark a discussion. The story is told from a single point of view, from a single narrator, that of the view of the, of the mother, and in fact, it's fascinating to peel apart the layers and see the way that she presents information, because this is very much a love letter to Sailor, her son, and it's fascinating to see the ways in which she says something and you think, yeah, that's probably how it was, and then she says something else and you think, no, that's how she wishes to be remembered by her son. It's a fascinating narr narrator to follow, um, so a first-person narrator feels apt. Besides, she's an unreliable narrator in the proper definition of the world. She's so exhausted and so tired that it's hard to determine what's a product of her exhaustion-driven hallucinations and what's actually reality. And it's frightening and, well, anxiety-inducing to follow a narrative like this, when you're not quite sane to feel normal, but not quite insane enough to think that you're sane. In fact, there's a line I want to quote. The impulse to shove my husband hard in the chest was so strong that I turned and staggered away to thwart it, grappling with the doors and banisters that came reeling up at me as if I was a conveyor belt, because I wasn't in my right mind anymore. So you see that at times the prose is fabulous. The concept is executed flawlessly. It's it's great to follow a narrator who herself is aware that she's unreliable because it just adds that extra layer of consideration. The problem for me was the consistency. Of course, of course you can argue that it's because the narrator is unreliable, she's unable to be consistent, she's unable to be coherent, but really, sometimes we have these passages of wonderful beauty, and then we have something that reads like a cheap newspaper article, and then occasionally it's like a quip or like a joke that's funny, yes, and, dar and darkly comedic, but maybe not quite appropriate following the intensely emotional prose that was just before that. Soldier Sailor doesn't stick to anything for long. The beginning and the end feels like two different works, two completely different works, and in fact I'm not even going to start talking about the middle bit, where she either hyperfixates on the baby or hyperfixates on anything but the baby. There is an attempt to do stream of, stream of consciousness, but sometimes it's, it's so conscious that it feels like it's forced, that she's directing her attention to certain things, so that is by definition not really stream of consciousness, she's not allowing her mind to flow, and then other times it's so stream of consciousness that you don't really understand where it's going and you're not quite following it and it just feels unnatural. To be honest, I don't know if I'm expressing this correctly, but it feels like um, Kilroy just switches on party hats in this party of motherhood. Sometimes she's a wannabe Virginia Woolf. Other times her sentences are so dry, simplistic, and straightforward that Ernest Hemingway himself would be jealous. <laughs> it feels unbearably used, repeated, exhausted, not fresh, and the topic is so deep but we seem only to dip our toes into it if that makes sense. So it's like we're swimming over the Mariana Trench and we've gone so far to get to the Mariana Trench from rainy Ireland or however the weather is like, I don't know because the settings never fully developed. Uh, to, so we, we've covered this distance, we've paid for the trip, and then we just like occasionally swoop down, take a peek, and then surface right back up. So it's like, what was the point of getting here? We're not, we're just pushing conventions, but we're not really breaking them. And don't get me wrong, I still hold my previous stance. It's great to be raising this topic. It's great to like, again, be spreading this to the public eye, to be developing the message, but honestly, where is the nuance? The message is very much the familiar, and of course very, very necessary reminder, to respect motherhood and to respect the mothers that raised you and the immense effort that it takes into a child. A village raises a child, yes, and sometimes a mother who has to act on behalf of the entire village. So it's a necessary reminder, but also how many metaphors have I used so far? Like Dr. Chasuble, I love to speak in metaphors, but Claire Kilroy used only one. And yet, I said that it was extended throughout the novel, brilliantly developed. Uh, it was. It was carried on from the first pages, referred to a soldier sailor, to the last. The problem was that we dip in and out, and it seems that 
Kilroy haphazardly remembers that in fact there is this metaphor to uphold and then throws us something that's like, yeah, that's why a mother's like a soldier and then we move swiftly on. So we throw out that the baby's a sailor and then we move right back to traipsing the aisles of Ikea and socializing with other kids. And it just, it just doesn't feel novel. It goes back to what I previously said about this fe feeling used and exhausted as, not as a concept because there's a wealth of content there to explore, but as the way that it's presented, as the trope that we have before us. And throughout the story, as strange as it sounds, I just wanted to call the baby it, refer to Sailor as it, because I never really fell in love with Sailor the way that I think I was supposed to. Certainly the very first chapters, the first maybe three or four chapters of the novel, uh, the mother really tried to show how much she loves Sailor to the point where the descriptions were quite amorous. I thought that it was about a lover rather than a child at first, because the way that she described it was like, oh, you like your mind, you're not gonna be any other woman's, that kind of description. The way that she describes holding the baby in the arms, etc. But there really isn't much about Sailor that we love because we see that she loves him. So many other things going on that it feels very difficult for us to love him and indeed to view him as a character. And when it's a character that's almost like, although we never get his voice, that's almost like the main character, similar to Rebecca, who's never directly there, but always mentioned, it's a bit tough when you don't really view the baby even as a child, but just as it, because there's, like, it just feels like a plot device kind of thrown in. And I think that an apt example to use would actually be when we look at babies who are not our own. So of course we think our child is cute and our own baby photos are cute. But then sometimes like a mother will come along and she says, oh my God, look at my baby, isn't it so cute? And then she shows a photo and you just see this wrinkled blue baby that looks like any other baby straight out of being born. And I can tell you that they don't really look that good when they're just when they're just born. Uh, they, they're a bit blue, they're a bit wrinkled, you can't really see the features. They're not that cute up until they develop a bit more. So it feels a bit like the book is shoving that baby at us and asking us to say, oh, isn't this marvelous? Isn't this wonderful? When for us, it's still a bit of like a wrinkled blue not even a baby yet, because we haven't familiarized ourselves with the baby or it properly. And throughout the reading experience, I found myself wondering, am I missing something? Because postpartum depression was mentioned and then just never come back to. It was such an interesting avenue to explore. It could have added more layers to this, but we just never came back to it. Break, almost a breakup, almost a divorce, arguments were mentioned, alluded to, and then just ignored. It never happened. It was all just a bad dream. And throughout all this also, there were just some, some bits that felt so unnecessary in their anger towards men. Okay, allow me to explain. So there's a moment when the character, when the main character says that she was, so she's expressing frustration because her husband, who's absolutely useless by the way, can't even fasten their baby into the baby seat. And she just goes on a tangent about how she thinks that like how angry she is that men are so incapable because they can't even design a car seat. And it just feels a bit like she's very much displacing her anger at her incapable husband towards all men. And for us throughout the entire book, we were frustrated anyway because she just won't confront her husband. She just won't tell him like, hey, you need to like pull your weight. It's our child. It takes two to tango. So it's just incredibly frustrating to have her be constantly venting about the problem of men not contributing when she herself is contributing to the problem of men not contributing by not by not allowing her husband to do anything and it's actually pointed out as well he he tells her like you're you get mad at me for not helping but you won't allow me to help and then she's just like well yes but you're you're just not good enough but how is he supposed to learn again it's just and i understand that maybe it's actually part of the good aspects of the book that we get to see the complexity because that is sadly the case in many families that men go to work and they don't do anything around the house they don't contribute to the child because they think, well, actually, I'm contributing financially. That's my role. And we can go on a discussion about how perhaps that isn't really the same. Like, the demands are not the same to sit at an office job and to think with your brain and to bring home a rat of cash and to be able to go out and take a lunch break anytime you want and to sit with a screaming infant who won't calm down, get no money for it, and be told that that's your job. So 
I understand where it's coming from. But at the same time, it was just a massive point of frustration. And I feel like that was not intentional. So the book probably intended it for us to kind of really emphasize with Soldier and say, yeah, you're so right. Um, better car seats for babies need to be designed. But throughout the entire time, we were just like, can you tell your husband to do something? <laughs> like, can, can you actually act in a way that is, in a way that would allow him to do something rather than complaining about not even him but just all men in general but that isn't really something i took points off of the book for or anything that's just something that drove me personally insane it doesn't bode well for a book when all of all of it and all of its content can be summarized in just the blurb or in my case in a five minute description of the blurb so I think the issue was that it was just so similar to stuff I've read before. Like many, maybe two years ago, I read a book called Night Bitch, which I also didn't particularly love. It was, this was essentially Night Bitch 2.0, except that there was none of the dog stuff. So I would say that if you're looking for something that explores this topic, but in a more conventional way, uh, with less of the literary devices that I personally really enjoy, or less of the weird strange stuff that goes on uh, like mothers turning into dogs and the other book I mentioned this is for you but as a women's prize for fiction shortlist really I know I'm in the minority but it's just very hard to really be able to recommend this to anyone because I feel like it has a very specific audience which is just frustrated parents who want to vent and have their very valid feelings validated which which is a valid category but then if the literary marriage is not so strong and the content is not, not so nuanced and it fits a specific category of people, does it is it really deserving to be placed into the Women's Prize for Fiction shortlist when the Women's Prize for Fiction shortlist is always under so much scrutiny to be upheld to a higher literary standard? So, I don't know. This is just my personal stance on this. Uh, if you feel like this is a topic that interests you, I don't mean to discourage anyone because I feel like this is something that's very, very important to talk about, but it was just personally not for me. So thank you so much for watching this review. Uh, thank you for making it this far and I will see you next week then.